Good morning, church. Welcome to worship at UMC on this first day of 2023. It's a joy to be starting this new year with all of you and also our cloud of witnesses on Zoom. It's good to have you all here. We're going to start this morning with a prelude.
Ben, thank you for compiling that um, amazing collection of um, pieces of our weeks every week. That's really a fun thing to start off our service with. <clears throat> In this first week of 2023, churches all around the world are continuing to celebrate Jesus' birth with feast days and saints days scheduled all the way from Christmas Day through Epiphany. Um, in this community, we have been commemorating Advent with birds. We have the Cardinal of Hope, the Bluebird of Peace, the Sparrow of Joy, the Hen of Love, and the Dove that symbolizes the Holy Spirit's presence with us. Um, so today, on January 1, the Chorus of Birds and our Five Candles of Advent are still with us um, to welcome the New Year. So after Ben lights the Advent candles, we'll join together in prayer. Go ahead, Ben. Let's pray together. God of light and wings, we praise you that this light that has come into the world in Jesus has not been overcome by darkness. We praise you for birds, the heralds of the dawn, and we pray that we will be heralds of your light and your presence in this world. It's in the name of Jesus, God with us, Emmanuel, that we pray. Amen. And now I invite you to join me in our scripture reading for today, uh, words from the book of Isaiah that speak to the Israelites in exile <clears throat> and compare their plight to that of a barren woman or a widow. In that time, women without children or husbands would have lived on the margins of an already conquered and humiliated people. But this passage names God as a husband to the people of Israel and invites them against all evidence to the contrary to enlarge their tents to make room for the children to come, children who will be taught by the Lord. Not only does God see those on the margins, God calls them by name and claims them and redeems them. So let's read these words together. Shout for joy, O barren one who has borne no children. Burst into song and shout, you who have not been in labor. For the children of the desolate woman will be more than the children of the one who is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the sight of your tent and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you will spread out to the right and to the left, and your descendants will possess nations and will settle desolate towns. Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed. Do not be discouraged, for you will not suffer disgrace. For you will forget the shame of your youth, and the disgrace of your widowhood you will remember no more. For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer, the God of the whole earth he is called. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you.
Oh, afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted, I am about to set your stones in antimony and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of jewels, and all your walls of precious stones. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the prosperity of your children. Let's join together in singing, beginning with number 258 in the Purple Voices Together hymnal.
Good morning, University of Mennonite Church. When I think about uh, qualities of birds, one characteristic that comes to the top to me is persistence. Persistence is that ability to continue to keep working on something despite all the obstacles. It's that determined, focused perseverance. And you can see that perseverance in a number of activities of birds, like for example, in nest building. Uh, there are some birds where if they begin a nest and for some reason it uh, gets destroyed or blown away or um, knocked over, they're not easily dissuaded. They start all over again and they just keep working at it. They're focused and they're persistent. Or you see that in a woodpecker, constantly banging away at a tree in hopes of getting food. Or in the activities of adult birds as they search far and wide for food to feed their young. Or the determination of fledglings as they work their wings in an attempt to make their first flight. In the Bible, we hear about God's steadfast love, his love that will endure forever, persistence. And that, in spite of all the obstacles that we seem to create for that love, as a people, we do a good bit of messing up, enough for God to say, all right, I've had enough, yet God's love perseveres. And there's a, a big element of hope in that word perseverance, and I need to hold on to that hope as I hear the news of the world every day. I want to be perseverant um, and not get discouraged about things like the environment and constant violence and injustice and all the other things. And I have to admit that I get overwhelmed by it all at times. But the examples of the persistence of birds is good for me to remember that perseverance in spite of difficulties, as well as God's persistent love, and to remain hopeful and help me be positively engaged in this world. Thank you. Along with birds this Advent, we have been hearing the stories of the women of the Bible who um, were visited by angels. And so in that, um, in that tradition, we bring you a, a new reading of Matthew 1, the genealogy that um, has traditionally been um, comprised of the names of men. And so hear this new reading with some new names. A genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Miriam, the daughter of Anna. Sarah was the mother of Isaac, and Rebekah was the mother of Jacob. Leah was the mother of Judah. Tamar was the mother of Perez. The names of the mothers of Hezron, Ram, Aminadab, Nashon, and Salmon have been lost. Rahab was the mother of Boaz, and Ruth was the mother of Obed. Obed's wife, whose name is unknown, bore Jesse. The wife of Jesse was the mother of David. Bathsheba was the mother of Solomon. Nema the Ammonite was the mother of Rehoboam. Macha was the mother of Abijam and the grandmother of Asa. Azubadah was the mother of Jehoshaphat. The name of Jerohom's mother is unknown. Athaliah was the mother of Ahaziah, Zibiah of Beersheba, the mother of Joash. Jechaliah of Jerusalem bore Uzziah. Jerusha bore Jotham. Ahaz's mother is unknown. Abi was the mother of Hezekiah. Hephzibah was the mother of Manasseh. Meshulameth was the mother of Ammon. Jedidah was the mother of Josiah. Zebedah was the mother of Jehoiahim. Nehushta was the mother of Jehoiachin. Hamutai was the mother of Zedekiah. 
Then in the deportation to Babylon, the names of the mothers go unrecorded. These are their sons, Jeconiah, Shiltiel, Zerubbabel, Abuyid, Eliachim, Azor, and Zadok, Achim, Eliud, Eleazar, Matan, Jacob, and Joseph, the son of Miriam. Of her was born Jesus, who is called Christ. The sum of generations is therefore 14 from Sarah to David's mother, 14 from Bathsheba to the Babylonian deportation, and 14 from the Babylonian deportation to Miriam, the mother of Christ. Children, you are welcome to come forward. All right, good morning. We have Jonas, Timo, Ben, Daniel, Alethea, and Annika. And who else? Gummy. Do you guys know how your parents chose your names? Does anybody know? Your name means what? Dove. Dove. What about you all? Do you know some of the meanings of your names? What's yours? Truth. Aletheia. God is my judge. Son of the right hand. Timo. You mean, your name means um, uh, one, who is, one who is faithful to God. Timothy. What is it again? Graceful and sweet. sweet. Beautiful names we have. Do you all know how Mary and Joseph chose Jesus' name? An angel told them. Both of them got angel visits with Jesus' name. It was pretty clear. Today is January 1, and some churches around the world celebrate today or tomorrow as Holy Name Day. Because in Jewish tradition, children would get named on the eighth day after they were born. So if you count from Christmas, this isn't quite eight days, today or tomorrow. Jesus would have gotten his name. They knew what his name would be, but I guess there was a a special naming ceremony on the eighth day. Well, maybe they just called him Jesus. Maybe they just called him Jesus, and then they told the world on the eighth day that his name was Jesus, right? And I learned something when I, was, when I was reading about this day, Timo and Jonas, you know what I learned? I learned that, so Jesus grew up speaking Aramaic, and the way, does anyone know how you say Jesus in Aramaic? Uh, you told us at breakfast. I did, I told you at breakfast. Isho. Isho is how you say Jesus. Jesus means um, the Lord is my salvation. The Lord is salvation. And in Aramaic, it's Isho. And so Mary would have said, Isho, time to feed your goats. Right? Isho, come in for breakfast. So it was, it was, it was kind of special yeah, to learn that pronunciation. Goats You're right. That's, that's right. I don't know how to say goats or breakfast in Aramaic. So, do you ever get called by a name that's not your name? Yes. What do people call you? People mispronounce it. Yeah, Annika. Althea. Daniel. Timo. Sometimes Timo. What? Yes, so sometimes, this is what I was getting at. Sometimes in our house, people call each other names that aren't their real name. They call them some mean names or some um, irritating names, right? And sometimes I think we also call ourselves names that aren't ours. Grown-ups do this too. Do you ever do something and you say, oh, I can't believe I was so 
dumb. We're actually not allowed to say that word in our house, but we say it anyway, right, guys? <laughs> Can't believe I was so dumb. You say it in your mind. That's a better place to say it. But we give ourselves names sometimes that aren't our true names, right? We give ourselves... Sometimes you call me Rover. I have actually called my child my, our cat's name before. I have called Daniel Rover. But that was not because I think you're a cat. It's just that I got mixed up. Yeah, so we call each other names that aren't our own, names that hurt our, each other sometimes. Uh huh. We get mixed up. Okay. Well, um, what I want to say is that when God calls us by name, God calls us our name, and God calls us beloved. Beloved, right? Yes. That's not our name, but it's not. It's a name that blesses us, right? And that shows us how much God loves us. So we can be sure that God will never get the wrong name when God calls you. No. Nope. So let's pray together before we go back to our seats. Dear God, thank you so much for each of these children. Thank you that you know their names and that you call them by name. I pray that as they grow and get to know you more, that they will find that they are, can hear you calling them beloved. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, beloved, let us begin with a full breath. Receiving this radical idea that God knows us and calls us by name. Pray with me. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, it is January 1st, and I know because I used to belong to a YMCA that this week and the next couple of weeks that place will be full, will be teeming with people that have showed up wanting to change, wanting to remake themselves, to change habits, to change goals, to be made into something new. And underneath that, I think there is this unstated belief that maybe we're not quite good enough as we are. Well, I know I'm not as thin or as fit or as well-read as maybe I'd like to be. Yes, there is improvement for change. But I don't know about you, I have given up on New Year's resolutions. Well, our scripture this morning hints at change, at something new beginning to happen. But our scriptures are not the type of change found in New Year's resolutions. No, I'd say our texts are an invitation to change, to experience God's love in transformative ways, in ways that go beyond who we look like. On our outer selves. In one of his daily devotions, Richard Rohr, priest, theologian, and author, writes about how up to the time of the Babylonian exile in the 6th century BCE, when the life of God's people must have felt like it was coming to an end. Back then, the Jewish people's belief and understanding of God, as it is for so many of us today, is in a re retributive form of justice, kind of a tit 
for tat. Something happens and there's a reaction, a response. It went something like this. Whoops. It went something like this. The people made a mistake relying not on God, but on themselves. I don't know about you, but that sounds familiar. They make a mistake, and then when the people turned away from gods, turned to other gods, trusted in their own making, then the people were punished, punished by God and suffered for what they'd done. And out of that suffering, they see the light and they change their ways, at least until next time. And then, only then, did they receive God's consolation and salvation. So that old model, I'm guessing the model that many of us grew up with, was this idea of God's love being based on mistake, then punishment, then repentance, and then, and only then, came consolation and salvation. Even today, most people kind of accept this logic because it makes the world feel fair and just. Reward and retribution kind of are in our hard wiring. They're in our current criminal justice system. This way of understanding this tit for tat, it seems like it's the plot line of so much of our lives. But as Bethany mentioned in our reading this morning of that sense of God's love that came out of that time of exile, the biblical story started to change. For God's ways are not our ways. God's love is about transformation. In one of the books of the Bible that we read so infrequently from the prophet Hosea, he speaks of God's love to the people of Israel in this way. And I want you to hear this because I think it speaks to this core of God's transformative love. In that poem of Hosea, God says, this is God speaking, I will love unloved. I will say to no people of mine, listen to that. God's love here is not for those who have already repented but those in need, those considered unworthy. God says to the unworthy ones, you are my people. And then, and only then, the people will answer back, you are my God. My friends, that is the divine pattern, a pattern of change that pivots around love, God's divine love. Because our understanding of love and acceptance is so often based on I will love you if or I will love you when, most of us find it really challenging to comprehend or receive this expansive love. If we are to believe the biblical revelation, it seems that God does not love the people Israel if they change, but so that they can change. God does not love the people if they change, but so that they can change. Divine love is not a reward for good behavior. Divine love is an invitation to something new, a larger life, an invitation to participate in that love of God. And then, and then out of that sense of being loved and welcomed, out of that acceptance, we too can become something new, can change our behavior. It was during and after the exile into Babylon that the prophets of old started seeing a different pattern of work of God's relating to God's people. And then the new pattern looked something like this. The people made a mistake once again turning away from God, thinking that they were in control, that they know best. And God reminds them that nothing, that no thing can separate them from divine love. It goes from mistake to that salvation of God's love showing up. 
And then, and then in that remembering, that remembering comes the change, the conversion. They're converted and transformation happens. Just one tiny little degree, little change at a time. All of us, we sin, we miss the mark. We forget that divine love is at the center of all things. Yes, God's love is not, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. God does not love the people if we change, but so that we can change. It's that catalyst that we need, hopefully for something new, for transformation to happen. Yes, divine love is the catalyst for change. Well, this morning we heard lots of names. We heard names of mothers. We heard names of our own children and what they mean. The names of mothers were read. We made note of the names of the mothers we do not know all a part of that long lineage of Jesus, the name that means the one who saves. This eighth day, the public naming of Jesus. We know so many names for him, Prince of Peace, Comforter, Counselor, Lord, Savior. Well, our call to worship this morning that we read together, it was written for a people in a time beginning something new coming out of a sense of real darkness, of real chaos, of not knowing if they would survive, would they find their way back home. And in that remembering, that divine love was brought in again and again with the prophet Isaiah saying, but now thus says Yahweh, the one who created you, the one who formed you, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Each one of us are called by name, known. That's transformative love. If you too were raised in that understanding of God's love was more an if, if we behave properly, if we do what we're supposed to do, then we receive God's love. This is a new way. God's love does not change us because we have done wrong. God's love does not change if we change, but so that we can change. It's the catalyst for change, little by little, inch by inch. The divine love seeks us, invites us to something new. This year, no New Year's resolutions are required. You're invited to receive that love and out of that love, choose a new way of being, a new life, a life rooted and grounded in that love so that we too can go forward as new people. No, no New Year's resolutions required. That's the good news, amen.
Mike and I would like to teach you a song to begin our confession time this morning um, that goes with our theme today. It's called, I Will Change Your Name, and the words will be on the screen. We're going to sing it through twice, and you're welcome to join in when you catch on. <clears throat> change your name you shall no longer be called wounded outcast lonely or afraid I will change your name your new name shall When we name ourselves not beloved, Lord, have mercy. When we name others not redeemable, Lord, have mercy. When we forget that all are known and loved by God, Lord, have mercy. But now, thus says the Lord, the one who created you, the one who formed you. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. I just want to take a moment as we move into a time of communion to dwell on those words a little bit that we just sung. That God changes our name. Our new name shall be confidence, joyfulness, overcoming one, faithfulness, friend of God, one who seeks my face. Yes, when God spoke to the people of Israel, those people coming out of exile, coming into a new land, a new way of being, God said to them, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. My friends, we come to the table this morning again in this new beginning, this new year, knowing that God calls us by name, even when we forget, even when we have forgotten what is at the center of our lives. We have this time of remembering, this time of remembering and of receiving the gift of love of sustenance so that we too can go into the world 
that we can share this transformational love, not a transactional love, but a transformational love. That's the good news that we get to go forward and share. So in just a moment, you will have an opportunity to come forward to take one of our little containers of bread and cup, those symbols, through gluten-free crackers and grapes. Take them back to your seat, and then we will partake together. But we remember, we remember that night so long ago when Jesus sat around a table, sat around a table with his friends, those who were dearest to him, his friends who would all betray him, who would all leave him that night. But he said to them, he said to them, come and eat. And he took a loaf of bread and he broke it and blessed it. He gave thanks to God and he said to his friends, come and eat, know me, live in me and through me and with me. And they ate together on that night. And then after the meal, he took the cup. He took the cup made of these simple grapes that were pressed into wine. And he passed that cup around the table, inviting each one to drink, saying, let my love quench you. Let this drink nourish you, that you too may go forth as redeemed and beloved to share that love. My friends, this morning this table is set for all, for all who seek, for all who desire that transformational love, for all who come, not because we are perfect, but because we desire the one who saves. So come, my friends, the table is ready. Come and eat. My friends, as we receive, as we sit at the table with Christ, receive the bread broken for you, redeemed for you. Let us eat.
and let us too receive the grapes as that symbol of wine poured out to nourish. As we bring this celebration of bread and wine to a close, join me in prayer. O Holy One, you who call us by name, you who remind us that we are loved and that out of that love we are invited to be made into something new, may this receiving of the body and the cup, remind us, nourish us, strengthen us that we too may go forth sharing the good news of love with one another. Amen. And join me, my friends, in saying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Are there any announcements this morning? I'm Laura Litwiller, and I want to highlight the Commonplace magazine. It's put out by MCC, and it tells stories about changed lives. And this particular issue, uh, we have issues in the back for anyone to pick up uh, on the bench out in the lobby. Uh, This particular issue has several from East Africa and some of these projects we visited, Ken and I, when we lived in Uh, Kenya and visited projects, so uh, it's exciting to see things still happening. Thank you, Laura. Ken Litwiller. So this is the first Sunday of the month as well as the first Sunday of the year, so we'll have a sermon response following our coffee time. Come, let's come prepared to share about um, hope for the new year and what God's transformative love means for us in that new year. Thank you, Ken. And I'll just add that in two weeks, we'll have another sermon response time. I believe a fellowship meal as well, and there'll be an activity for the children between church and the fellowship meal. Any other announcements or birthdays or anniversaries? Uh, Jim Perlin, um, 36 years ago, um, January 1st and January 3rd were beautiful days, and my wife and I moved our wedding from the 1st to the 2nd to avoid Penn State's football game, <laughs> and then the Fiesta Bowl moved the game to the 2nd, and we had 28 inches of snow. Oh. So, it was very memorable, and it's our 36th anniversary tomorrow. Oh, congratulations. Any other celebrations? All right, and do we have any visitors this morning who would like to introduce themselves or have their host introduce them? All right, it's just us. That's good, too. All right, I invite you to stand for the benediction and to remain standing for our final song, To Us a Child of Hope is Born. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, 
everything has become new. Go in peace. Um, I'll play the last lines of introduction and then uh, we'll sing we'll sing all three verses. <laughs> 